but yes, it's a it's a great pleasure to be here. I have one caveat um, before we start, which is that it is somewhat unusual for me to be talking about my research to complexity researchers. Usually, I am more talking to neuroscientists or uh, clinicians. I did my PhD in a in a clinical department. I am not a mathematician or a physicist or an engineer by training. I am a philosopher by training, actually. Um, so rather than expecting to find new and exciting mathematics that you've never heard of before, I don't think that's going to be likely. Rather, my suggestion would be that you take this talk as perhaps a demonstration of what can happen when uh, interdisciplinary research takes place. I, my understanding is that this is a place that is intended to foster interdisciplinary research, and everything that I'm going to be telling you about is the result of interdisciplinary research and collaboration. So uh, maybe that's the spirit in which this uh, this talk is intended, and then hopefully you'll also learn something about the brain that perhaps you um, didn't know before. So let's get started. And let's see if this actually changes. Yes. So um, as I mentioned, I started off in, in philosophy. And part of why I didn't fully stay in philosophy is because in, in some quarters, it's very common to have this idea that, well, if you're interested in consciousness, which is what I was interested in, how can you even study consciousness? That is, in, in the famous words of William James, consciousness is ever fleeting. It's like the flights and perchings of a bird. So trying to map consciousness from a scientific perspective, isn't it a bit like trying to make an atlas of the clouds? Isn't it almost paradoxical as an endeavor? And I decided to do my PhD in neuroscience because I thought maybe we can get some traction there with the tools that we have today. Maybe we don't need to wait for science fiction. We can get the science part right and then reduce the amount of fiction that's in there. And so if we start with this philosophical question, right, of how does the mind arise from matter, which is some, somewhat grandiose sounding, but we can maybe cash it out again in more understandable scientific terms, which is how does the brain, this particular lump of matter, support consciousness, this particular way of understanding mind? And in theory, that is a somewhat simple way of addressing this question. You take a brain that is conscious, you take a brain that is not conscious, and you compare them. You see what's the difference in their activity. And of course, we immediately hit a large number of roadblocks. Because, for example, there are many ways of losing consciousness. There are many ways of perturbing consciousness. In fact, we all experience sleep, temporary, physiologically necessary loss of consciousness. Some of us might have experienced anesthesia, which is an induced form of unconsciousness from which we regularly recover, that is the expected outcome, and that is desirable in the context of surgery. But there is also, for example, uh, disorders of consciousness, which occur, which hopefully none of us have ever experienced, and tend to occur as a result of uh, traumatic uh, or anoxic brain injury. So there's actually bits of brain often missing. And then on the other hand, among other pharmacological perturbations of consciousness, you can have psychedelics, which I hear are somewhat popular in this location, uh, this being the city, not necessarily the institute, and which alter consciousness without suppressing it. So they provide us with a potential spectrum or continuum that you can um, investigate. And so once you have all of these different perturbations, then what is it? that you want to be studying in comparison to the normal, quote unquote, conscious brain. All of a sudden, the problems start to multiply. Yes. Oh, yes, of Reversible course. Reversible disconnection, is it someone sleeping? Is that right? Yes, so there, there on the on the bottom left is someone. Uh, so is this considered sleeping. unconscious or is this considered totally conscious? So I people disagree about that. I think people would agree that when you are in dreamless, deep sleep, you're unconscious. Uh, people are, there's different views about, for example, dreaming in the context of, of, of REM sleep. I think the view that is 
uh, my own, but also I think reasonably popular, is that during REM sleep, you are conscious in the sense that there is something it's like to be you, um, but you are disconnected from the environment. So whatever is going on in your consciousness is not necessarily related to the environment that you're outside. You might be dreaming about flying over the city where in fact you're safely in your bed. And so that is, a, that is sometimes mimicked by some uh, anesthetics as well. So we need to draw a series of distinctions between being behaviorally responsive to the environment, being connected to it, which you might be even when you're not able to respond to the environment, for example, because you're paralyzed, and then being unconscious, which is where you just don't have any experiences at all, whether they're about the environment or something else. So you can go progressively, in a sense, you're going progressively further away from the environment up to the point where it's just complete loss of consciousness. But, but you don't, in all your words, you don't use the word self. You're yes. aware of the I, right? That's right. I am not talking about self-consciousness. I And I, I, I appreciate this, this remark because it's important for me to, to qualify that. I am not necessarily saying using the word consciousness to mean self-conscious or thinking about your own thoughts, this sort of very lofty understanding of consciousness. I mean the understanding of consciousness that is more um, understated. That is basically there's something it's like to be you <clears throat> as a human. And in the same way, basically, you one definition that we often use is that which you lose when you fall into dreamless sleep or anesthesia and recover when you wake up. So it's an operational definition rather than a necessary and sufficient conditions kind of definition that you would find in philosophy. It's a you know it when you see it kind of definition. And one of the reasons for this is precisely this part on the right about this life, which is to say that in particular, some of these perturbations like anesthesia are very, very conserved across the animal kingdom. So many of the same drugs that will put a human uh, under anesthesia will also work to suppress effectively all of the same kinds of behaviors in a monkey or in a mouse, but also they will suppress and mimic sleep-like behaviors in a worm. So you can have the worm stops moving, it stops responding to stimuli, stops fleeing from pain, it stops going towards food. So all of the same kinds of things that you would expect in uh, mammalians are also observed there. And then, of course, we don't know if there's a sense in which we can talk about the animal being conscious, but we can talk about the nematode being disconnected from its environment in the sense that objectively, from the behavioral perspective, it does not interact with it in ways that would be suitable for its um, survival. And the other aspect of why most of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be primarily centered around anesthesia um, with interactions with some of the other perturbations is that anesthesia and pharmacological perturbations in general are very helpful for bridging the gap between micro scale and macro scale in the brain. Because even though the behaviors that we observe are at the macro scale, the person stops moving, they stop talking, they stop responding. And as we're going to see in a minute, there's interactions within the macro scale of the brain. Nonetheless, these are very micro scale interventions because each of these drugs is effectively acting on a subcellular scale. It's acting on some individual cells and it's acting on some individual or groups of receptors. So we know pharmacologically what's happening. We know the micro scale of the chemistry, what is happening. And then somehow those micro scale changes are cascading upwards into suppressing behavior. And for me, this is extremely fascinating. And hopefully, given that we're talking about emergent phenomena, this might resonate with um, some of you at least. But that is going to be the perspective that we take. So we can study in a translational manner across species, and we can also study in a manner that allows us to bring some of these scales closer together. Now, one aspect of this question that I find um, particularly fascinating, and, and that's why I, I chose to share it with this audience today, is that, of course, the various mental states that we go through 
have to be underpinned by corresponding changes in brain activity. Because if we're not dualists, then we believe that the brain is responsible for changes in the mind at some relatively coarse level. So those patterns of brain activity are constantly changing, even though the network of connections itself, the anatomy itself is not. The anatomy is staying fixed, at least in the order of a few seconds, like uh, you might be going through several different states within those few seconds. You might be thinking, what is this person thinking? I wish I stayed home today. Bed was very nice and warm. What am I going to have for lunch later? Very quick changes in thoughts, despite your brain anatomy staying the same. So how is that happening? Do we have an understanding for that? And of course, one way we are all familiar with this problem, that is effectively the same problem as understanding why is it that sometimes there's a lot of traffic on the road and then other times there isn't, even though the roads stay the same. So it's a matter of relating structure, the pattern of roads, which stays the same, and we all know how long sometimes that gets to change to function. In this case, we can think of traffic, but we can also think of activity and interactions between different regions of the brain. And so this is the perspective that we're taking, which is why I, I think this, this talk might be relevant for this particular audience. And you might be familiar with this, um, with this figure here, these patterns of sand that is randomly distributed over a metal plate and then as the metal plate is made to vibrate at specific frequencies, then all of a sudden the sand aligns according to the specific frequency in these highly symmetric and, and complex patterns that you can see. And the reason why I'm showing this beyond this being a, a pretty picture is because this is how some um, in, in our field have started to think about this relationship between structure and function in the brain and how the connectivity of the human brain might be shaping the way that patterns of brain activity occur. In other words, there's this idea that, well, brain regions are connected by physical white matter tracts, and maybe those are fundamentally shaping the kinds of brain patterns that we can observe in terms of activity in the brain. And so this is an, an example of this. We, we call it the connectome, um, uh, the human connectome. And we can image it with very, um, very good resolution, not perfect by any means, but very good resolution in vivo and non-invasively. We can use diffusion MRI for this, and it can then be validated against more invasive methodologies, for example, in, in macaques or mice. And there is good, although not perfect, agreement with the track tracing. So we can image which white matter fibers are connecting different regions of the brain, which means that we can get a, funk, a structural network of connections between different parts of the brain. And then we can apply the same mathematics that tells us how these patterns of sand will organize over a metal plate and instead apply it to patterns of brain activity, self-organizing over the connectome of the human brain. And as you can see, we can sort of see similar kinds of pictures. This is purely a qualitative, uh, uh, qualitative <laughs> demonstration, but just to see, it might make sense to observe these kind of patterns also in a system that is so, uh, in a sense, so different from uh, just sand on a metal plate. Yes. So you use the example of the of Stelians, um, you know, where the the connectome is known explicitly. And, and yet there's this disconnect between the dynamics and, and how we think uh, the, the neurons talk to each other. So do you worry about that? Like, is it possible that the connectome isn't that relevant? You know, uh, and that it, there's, there's all kinds of other things that we need to understand before we can make that link? Or I'm just kind of wondering how relevant you think it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing there's sort of two, I'm going to give a two part yeah. answer to that. Um, one is, I haven't seen this used for C. elegans. I'm not sure why, because that is a very relevant question. Um, the other thing is, the, the, other, the other part of that is the mathematics, and you'll see it um, shortly, the mathematics that we use for this is very simple. So we know that that is only a rough approximation of what must be happening underneath. 
The point of this is not to say we have found the one through single equation that governs how brain activity relates to structure. We know that we cannot find that because there's just too much complexity going on. The point of this is more to say, even just this relatively simple approximation uh, that you'll see in a moment can capture a lot of the phenomena that we see. So there, there is something there that is telling us about this relatively crude relationship between brain structure and function. And then we can go more into what exactly is, is happening there. Um, but yes, of course, there's a lot going on at the individual, at the level of individual cells and, and, and so on, you know, different neurotransmitters. This is basically modeled as a diffusion process, right? Whereas we know that sometimes that just not quite right. Now, in terms of could the connectome just not be relevant? So for example, there was a, a nature paper, I think last year, uh, yes, last year, um, that was saying actually using exactly the same equations that I'm gonna be that I'm gonna be showing. So effectively a diffusion process, but saying, well, instead of a network of connections between regions, we can use a network of proximity between different patches of the cortex. So using effectively the the cortical folding and geometry of the brain, and then saying we can get a lot of this structure function relationship just from that, ignoring the, the connections. My hunch for that is, again, sort of two parts, right? One is, well, that geometry and the connectivity of the brain are not two independent things that you can test against each other, because we know that there is an exponential distance relationship with connections. So Patches of cortex that are closer to each other are more likely to be connected. But also it would be kind of funny if you'll forgive this rather non-scientific explanation, but it would be funny if we just had a connectome and it's so conserved across different species, et cetera, and it's just doing there nothing. So I think if we failed at that, and I'm gonna show that I don't think we are failing, but even if we did, that would mean that we're not capturing the right thing rather than meaning it's there, but for no reason. But hopefully you'll see in, in a moment why I think that maybe we do have something here. Um, and so this is just some of the some of the patterns that you can observe out of this diffusion process. Uh, yes. A question. So sure. is the idea of this harmony something like if I am an, if I were a neuron and then I convince other neurons to dance with me to the part, to the same music, then I can like through local convincing and then this spreading, I could like send the global information to a lot of stuff because harmonic has a lot of structure no that's not quite how we think of that um it, it might be there might be part of that um the way we think of it is more as a way of looking at the brain and i think it's uh, yes it's the next slide so use looking at the brain instead of with a focus on different spatial patches of cortex focusing on different spatial scales um, so you, the, the point of this slide is to say, look, some of these uh, patterns, we call them connect from harmonics, harmonic modes. I'm going to be using them more or less interchangeably. Some of these patches are very uh, large scale. They cover, for example, an entire hemisphere, front or back of the brain, and then progressively they become more fine grained. This is entirely expected from the mathematics, but of course, uh, for neuroscientists, this is not obvious and, and worth um, remarking on. And as I was mentioning earlier, uh, this is not the mathematics of this I did not invent, and the application of this mathematics to the brain I did not invent either. Uh, that goes to Selene Atasoy. There's a lot of different papers using and then rediscovering eigenmodes in the brain. Every couple of years you have a high impact paper that discovers that you can apply eigenmodes to the brain. It's fantastic to see. Um, but this is, uh, this is the one that has really shaped a lot of, of, of my research, and I think it's also uh, one that many uh, many others have have been uh, informed by, including this uh, nature paper from last year. Yeah, I have a question about brain. Uh, yes, of course. Just, uh, when you show the uh, bubble grains, you have different frequencies. Do you just get different harmonics depending on the pattern? Here it's not clear to me what you are changing. I can understand you do a Fourier term uh, <laughs> model analysis that you get all the different harmonics, but. Is that clear to me which mode becomes our membrane, or you just you have a superposition of all these modes at the same time? Yes, it's the latter. So, and hopefully this will this slide will help a little bit with that. Um, so all of this is exclusively in the spatial domain. So here we do not involve the temporal domain uh, at this point, at least. Later on, time will come into play. Right now, it does not. 
So usually, and you know, again, this is a slide more designed for neuroscientists, but many neuroscientists are familiar with the Fourier transform as applied to a temporal signal because you want to find a particular, you know, instead rather of going in the time domain, you want to go in the frequency domain to find different oscillations and their contribution to your signal. And here we are doing exactly the same thing, but instead of switching from the time domain to the domain of temporal frequencies, we're switching from the space domain to the domain of spatial frequencies. So usually in the vast majority of cases, any neuroimaging anatomy uh, and analysis, and I should be clarified that this, we're talking about functional MRI data, for example. So patches of cortex of, you know, centimeter scale. Any neuroimaging analysis often says, we find a change in this region. We find a change in that region. So they are localized. They have spatial resolution. What they cannot tell you is what is the pre prevalent scale at which a particular phenomenon is happening. Are you seeing large scale or are you seeing fine grain changes? Just like you could say in a temporal domain, we find a change in the signal at this point in time, but we don't know whether that what's happening is in you know, slow frequencies or fast frequencies. And this is what we want to look at here in this context. So we lose the spatial resolution and with this spatial graph Fourier transform, really, what we're gaining is the resolution in space, um, in terms of spatial scale. Technically, rather than being Euclidean space, it's graph space, but um, in most cases, that is for this purposes um, equivalent. So I'll be talking about when I say frequencies from now on, please understand that to be um, spatial frequencies, not temporal. So you're talking about this progress. Right. I do not know that term, but it's just a change of the, the way we, we call it is a change of basis functions. Yeah. You're looking at exactly the same thing, but from a different perspective. And the point of this is to say that perspective tells us something that we might care about, <laughs> which is it tells us whether if the phenomenon that we are observing is relatively coupled from the structure of the network underneath or relatively decoupled from it. Because those large scale harmonics are very strongly dependent on the organization of the underlying connectome. So as, as you can see here at the, uh, at the bottom, when a, with a large scale harmonic, a large scale pattern, effectively units tend to be co-activated. So they have the same sign in this representation as their neighbors on the network. Whereas with a high frequency harmonic, whether you're connected to some other unit or not, is not going to be predictive of whether you have the same activation sign as them or not. So you can, one of them can be more active and the other less active and vice versa, even though they are physically connected to each other. Not so for the large scale harmonics, which is why we call them structurally coupled versus structurally decoupled. Uh, sometimes in, in the literature of this application to neuroscience, uh, you will see them also called uh, liberal and constrained, but it's the same idea. High, high frequencies are less related to the underlying structural connectome. Of course, they are mathematically obtained from it, but the signal that you see from them is not so dependent on whether two units are connected. But it measures correlations. Not quite. So, well, in, in a sense, it's it's very, uh, very similar because this next slide is about how we relate this to uh, act the function of an actual brain, right? So up to this point, we get the various harmonics, but those harmonics are all obtained from a static connectome. So you have a connectome and then you obtain mathematically what are the patterns that you should be observing, these orthogonal patterns that would emerge from interactions at different spatial scales on that connectome. And then our question is, can we use this as a new basis function to re-represent brain activity that we see in an actual living brain? So typically what we have is a signal in the spatial domain. So every patch of cortex has a, some activation of that signal. And then we, we track that over time. And here for each individual one of those brain volumes, so images of the entire brain that we obtained from functional MRI, we re-represent it in the domain of these spatial of these uh, connectome harmonics. 
And that is basically just, and this is going to be one of the only equations I have in, in this talk, that is just a linear combination of those. They are orthogonal, so we can do this, and we just sum them up. And we see effectively how much of this particular low frequency or this particular high frequency is present in my data. In this particular person scanned for usually five to 10 minutes. Can I, can I ask you? Yes. Because um, you started out with the, uh, with the sand and the different mm -hmm. harmonics, but there there is an external signal actually that causes that, that structure to arise. Um, you're now talking about the connected zone and about basically about the set of eigenfunctions in the connected zone in which you decompose your uh, atomic light. But is are these eigenfunctions just only determined by the connected zone, or is there any external driver like in the sand? So we obtain them from the connectome just uh, image like obtained from a, a group representative connectome. So these are the ones just a bit like you know the the uh, the Fourier basis from a Fourier transform temporal Fourier transform. They are obtained, you know, they are the eigenfunctions of a it's circle. The, it's the eigenfunctions functions of the of yes the of the okay. human connectome in general, like from a thousand people. Yes. And then you ask, how does spontaneous fluctuation <laughs> yeah. map on these? Exactly. Okay. Just like you could say, in for example, in EEG, you could ask, how does my spontaneous fluctuation in brain activity map onto these eigenvectors of a circle, effectively, which are the sinusoids. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. And the next one, I hope you'll bear with me. This is how, in many cases, uh, maybe just like sure. to clarify something. Yes, um, you're not looking at all the harmonics. You're only looking at the one corresponding to the pairwise network, right? So you're you're. Yes. So we have a the connectome I, is two uh, D. So it's uh, a pairwise. It so reflects pairwise connectivity. And then you're taking the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Of yes, the that's right. So no, no higher order interactions were hurt in this process. Um, yes. Um, so yes, as it is just a pairwise matrix of that, the DSNC matrix, and then I gain the composition of that. If I say that to neuroscientists, sometimes I lose them. So I often don't that makes go that way. <laughs> this, and you'll see next what I usually say to neuroscientists to get them on board with this. Because sometimes there's two kinds of neuroscientists, and and I don't forget I work I work a lot with clinicians as well. And clinicians, their angle is tell me what I can do to understand my patients better. So if I start going on eigen eigenvectors and eigenvalues, computational neuroscientists will be on board. Other kinds of neuroscientists will be lost. So this is the slide that I usually use to explain to them what we are actually doing. This is. <laughs> I kid you not, I've used this multiple times. You have a smoothie and you know that there are a fixed set of ingredients that can go in that smoothie. And you know that you can use, for example, the color to tell what ingredient is more or less prevalent in there. And so what you're doing is you're looking at the smoothie and you're just reconstructing what are the likely ingredients that went into it. That is how we think about this harmonic decomposition of brain activity. Do I have the red smooth, the red fruit or the orange fruit? High frequency harmonics, low frequency harmonics. That's a good point. <laughs> so just one technical question. So sure. You did this on an adjacency matrix, basically. These, these, they're, it's not weighted. Right. Oh uh, yes, yes it is. It is weighted. Yes. But are you using the Laplace or not? Because I yes. it, so this is more like that. It's not really the static matrix. You're taking the Laplace and only. So we effectively what we are modeling it is we are modeling it as a as a diffusion process. So we're using the Laplace. That that's what I meant when I said it's a very simple dynamics because we're taking we're taking the adjacency matrix. It's weighted. Then we're getting the Laplace. Of that, which effectively means we're looking at a diffusion process and we are seeing how do things more or less diffuse over this network, which we know is not the full story. And there's a there's actually a different set of uh, like for example a, a review paper last year in network and uh, nature reviews neuroscience. So th there's a whole set of analysis in network neuroscience looking at different communication models and asking should we think of communication between different regions as a diffusion process 
or as a navigation process where you have some bias in the random walk or as a process of shortest path communication where we know where we should go. And usually the answer is something like the search information tends to be the most accurate representation of what's going on. Uh, the diffusion process that we have here is usually a pretty good approximation for many of the processes that we see. And the nice thing is we have all of these tools that we can use for this you know, graph Fourier transform to get some insight into that, that some of the other processes we currently don't. But we, we know that this is not the full story, that this is some approximation of what's, of what's happening. So, for example, all of this will effectively ignore what uh, often in, in network neuroscience is talked about, you know, small worldness and the fact that networks are organized, these connectomes are small world networks. That is effectively not taken into account much in this analysis because we're just diffusing and ignoring the potential for a shortest path to really cut down on the time. Does that answer your question? Wait, you have that. But why don't you have the small world risk? Because you have the network. Yes, yeah, yeah. But we're not as so if, even if there's a shortcut that can go from A to B, yeah. we're still modeling that as you know, it's just a diffusion process. So you could, you know, you could have a lot more signal if you were using a navigation. If, if instead of modeling this as a diffusion process, uh -huh. we were modeling this as a shortest path communication, the network would be fairly different. So here we're just using all of the connections including the shortcuts, but not necessarily just the shortcuts as we would if we were navigating on the metro, if that makes sense. So it's in a way it's hidden in within that network, but it's not made as much use of okay. as you would expect if you knew that your signal in A is just trying to get to B as quickly as possible. And so that smoothie analogy, that is effectively what we are doing with our functional MRI data. And we have 18,000 harmonics, so we get a fine-grained uh, connectome, which is possible because we have uh, about 1,000 people, so we can get good resolution. Uh, and then we bin them into logarithmic bins. And this is not out of any particularly uh, principled reason. It's more that this is what we have been doing, and there seems to be something going on there. So often we will then show that you can get similar results if instead of 15 bins, you use... 10 or 20, but this is usually the way that um, we, we conduct that analysis just to get some um, reasonable statistical power. And the principle is very simple. There's basically only one thing that we do, which is to say, once we have across our various people, the signature of how much contribution there is from each of these different groups of harmonics from high to low frequency to the functional signal, then we repeat that analysis under some different perturbations. So we scan people while they are resting in the scanner, not doing anything special. And then we say, how does this change if instead you give LSD to the person? This is what's being shown here. And this is what you see. So people under LSD, you see a lot less contribution of the low frequency harmonics and a lot more contribution of the high frequency harmonics. And all of this is corrected for multiple comparisons, of course. It's not just a matter of that. Um, and yes. The harmonics that you're showing us here are. Sorry, say again. The harmonics that you're showing us yes. here, they are from. So you have the fMRI data, and then. Yes. How do you compute the harmonics? So the harmonics are always computed as we've seen here. But now in the fMRI data, you don't have a network, right? So. So in the. In the fMRI data, what we have is the activity. So we're using those harmonics as the new basic function to represent the activity. So, so this process. Doing... Yeah. Building uh, a pairwise correlation network, something like that. Mm, no, no. Not, for the, not for the the composition. So the harmonics we get scanned a thousand people, diffusion MRI, so static brain images. We know which brain regions are connected, how physically. We obtain the harmonics. This is our new basis function, our new space. It's a complicated, you know, it's a fancy way of getting, you know, for example, the Fourier transfer, yeah. but instead of being in space, in time, it's in space. Mm -hmm. Those we keep fixed. Throughout, those are always going to be my harmonics. What changes is we ask how much do these harmonics contribute to brain functional signals observed over time? And then for these analysis, we just collapse across time. Mm -hmm. So we don't change, we don't track changes across time. We just say, okay, this is more or less the overall functional pattern that we see in this new space. So we could have done the same analysis, and often people do the same analysis, by asking, 
How does my signal change in this particular location here? How does it change in that location here? Mm -hmm. Here, instead, we ask, how does it change at spatial scale one to mm -hmm. spatial scale 18,000? But we don't get new harmonics. In other language, you get the fMRI signal and you fit into combinations of the wave and like the Ws. Yeah. And then what you reported was like how much of each wave happened for LSG. Yeah. So we're just getting new values for the new new Ws. So we're getting new contributions of each harmonic to the signal that we observe. And then we ask, how does those contributions change? Just one more thing. The yeah. modes are computed from the physical point. Yes. The Static <laughs> the structural connectome. Get some modes based on more like functional. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked. Yes, you can. So that is uh, the same cell and atasoy. They also have a, I think it's a cell reports paper where they're using functional harmonics. And basically, when I was joking that people keep rediscovering harmonics, uh, they do. So now you have the nature paper last year was harmonics, but on a geometric connectome. So instead, you just ignore the connectivity. You just say, are these two patches of cortex near each other or not? And they do it in a very fine grained pattern. And then they do the same thing. And they find that you can reconstruct a lot of the functional activity using just neighbor neighborhood, basically. So geometry, as they call it. You can use structural connectome, you can use functional connectome, you can use gene co-expression matrix. That's something that we're now working on. So any brain-related network, you can do it. But basically, your, your connectome is a, is a big matrix. Of yeah. Big matrix of physical connections. Physical yeah. Contracts. So um, uh, you said you, you basically uh, compute the eigenvectors. Of the well, first we get the Laplacian and then the computer the eigenvectors. Okay, is it the Laplacian of that yeah. uh connectome? So, a DSNC matrix weighted the DSNC matrix. It's going to be both for the yeah. Right. yeah, so um, any role of the eigenvectors? Yes, they come into the weighting of the contribution. Okay. Because uh, from my understanding, if you call mm -hmm. the uh, spectrum as a, as a function of k, which k is a, a wave number, uh, how do I have to think about these numbers? I mean, are, what units are they? Mm -hmm. For example, if I have 10,000, is that equivalent to a single neuron size or something like that? No. So here we have about 20,000 uh, vertices. So it's in, older, it's in, in the order of millimeters. Like the smallest patch that you can get here is in the order of a few millimeters. Yes. Well, it's a box, so it's a box. Effectively, it, this is projected onto the cortex, so we're not uh, voxels anymore. So it, it is a quiet in voxel space of size of usually like, say, two by two, for example, two by two by two. Um, and then it is projected onto the cortex. But that is that is the native resolution that we have. So we can't go sub millimeter effectively. And even if we did, you know, there is still a correlation, so there's a little bit of, of, of signal loss there anyway. So it's roughly uh, one over millimeters. Pretty much. And so, as I was saying, then what we get is how does that signature, so how does the contribution that we see of different harmonics, and effectively we don't care about the specific harmonics, what we care is more or less their spatial scale, so from high frequency to low frequency, you can think of this as almost binary in a way. How does that change as I perturb the spontaneous activity of the brain with different pharmacological interventions? So here we have LSD, which is psychedelic, but this picture doesn't tell you, is this about the particular mechanism of LSD? Is this about this particular psychedelic or is it something more general? that we can uh, look at. And so some earlier work and then some more recent work uh, from this year, actually, we see with two different serotonergic psychedelics, we see pretty much the same pattern. So again, low frequency harmonics, reduced contribution, high frequency harmonics, increased contribution. And this is uh, with psilocybin and DMT, which have different molecular profiles as LSD, but they also have one big thing in common, which is they're all agonists of the serotonin 2A receptor. So their main molecular pathway of function is the same. So we know that this is not specific to LSD, but it's at least more general to different serotonergic psychedelics. Yes. It's a pretty sharp cutoff. It seems similar across K. So is there 
the meaning to that scale? Can you can you put a mechanistic understanding on that scale? No. The, I, I wish I could, and you'll see later on that that's not always at that particular point, and it changes a bit if you change the number of bins that you have. Um, so that, that's what I was mentioning. It's basically binary in the way that we think about it. It's really just low frequency. What you see is less coupling and more decoupling, which is, makes sense given the meaning of those two. Um, and interestingly enough, this reduced coupling under psychedelics of structure and function is something that you can also see using different techniques. For example, how the functional connectivity is similar to the structure. So here we don't get correlations between activity patterns, but if you did, and you looked at how they change during uh, psychedelic versus not psychedelic, you would see that function and structure become more decoupled also in that way. So the functional, the co-activation of regions becomes less similar to the physical connections mm -hmm. between regions. And sorry, yes. because in the labels it's only this, with the psychedelics, mm -hmm. but uh, they are already plotting the difference from the controls. So how do you compare the controls? Right. So it's always against placebo. Oh, okay. So in all of these cases, that, that's that's uh, that's important. Thank you. So in all of these cases, we scan the same people twice. We scan them once after administration of placebo. And then you scan them again after administration of the drug. And of course, they don't know which is which, although it's not particularly hard to tell. Uh, allegedly, I have to never try it. Uh, so not the best placebo, but it is placebo controlled. And actually for the DMT study, we also have a before and after, and the signature is basically identical. Um, so regardless of whether you scan before and after the, the administration or placebo versus drug, it's this is one of the reasons why I particularly like working with this kind of potent pharmacological interventions, because even though the samples might be small, the effects are so profound that you see like this high level of consistency. But there is, yes. So then what do we mean energy difference is placebo minus control? So increase would mean there is more of this in the drug than in the placebo, and decrease would mean there is less of this in the drug than in the placebo. So it's always to be interpreted that way. Thanks. Can I, I ask another question? So sure. I show, of course, I mean the difference. Yes. But can you also say something about the percentage that in the real change? So the actual, I mean, the, I mean, uh, let's say the, the factor that it actually mm -hmm. You mean like the, the effect size, basically? Is that, is yeah. that what you're so asking? Because this is, I mean, if I look at the, I don't, I can't in, in, interpret this, but this is 0 0.01. Is that meaning 1% difference? No, we don't. We never interpret the the actual change on the on the scale. Well, what can you actually say? Or is it, is it? So part of the problem, especially when you're trying to compare across different studies, is that that is going to depend, for example, on um, the resolution of your scanner. Some of those scanners had higher or lower temporal resolution, higher or lower spatial resolution. So comparisons within <coughs> across different data sets we tend to do them only at the course level of where do we see the increases and decreases rather than the actual um, numbers, like the actual magnitude of those. More or less, they are consistent, but as you'll see later on, different drugs can have quite different uh, values on those on those scales. But, but, In fact, you can see this here, much smaller, much smaller okay. than this additional drug. So this is, oh, sorry, you had a question. Yeah, it's actually a, 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 it's similar to the previous question. Mm -hmm. um, you showed the back, you showed the the, the, the distribution of the different modes, mm -hmm. uh, which was by uh, which was by unimodal. Um, the, do the values in these different graphs actually depend on that uh, on that unimodal uh, character, or what? Not so much. So you see, you see this this yeah, pattern so, here, but that's not where you see. You know, some of the differences might be just above, you know, just beyond this ten to the second uh, mark. So it's not. If you look at what, if if what you're asking is, is there a correlation between the deltas and the static magnitudes? The answer is no. No, yeah, but the, is the delta relative? Is it a, is, is it a fraction or is it a percentage yeah. or is it an absolute value? No, but here you can see it. No, so this is the absolute value, I think, and yeah. then you can see the difference. Uh, yeah, this curve you can see the difference. Yeah, so it's the dark blue and the and the light blue. Sorry, the dark green and and light green. Yeah, now this is very similar. Okay. Yeah.
and then you can see that this is yeah yeah and we don't in yeah. these cases we don't focus too much on the individual uh individual values but rather what we care about is the fact that you can see a consistent pattern that is then the same across different psychedelics and is also the same especially for the increasing high frequencies with a different uh psychedelic so ketamine is an interesting drug because at high doses, it acts as an anesthetic, although it's an atypical anesthetic because uh, exactly what I was talking about at the beginning, that is an anesthetic that disconnects you from the environment without making you unconscious. But at a low dose, it acts instead like a psychedelic. Again, atypical psychedelic, it doesn't have all of the other features of the classic psychedelics, which is why it's not a classic psychedelic. But it has, for example, it can induce hallucinations, it can use depersonalization, sometimes going into ego dissolution, etc. So it induces a lot of the similar phenomena. Not all of them, but many of them enough to be considered at least as a psychedelic. And what we see is that the low frequency harmonics, there's not too much going on. But the high frequency harmonics, you see this again, this pattern of more of these structured disconnected uh, elements taking place even with this other kind of psychedelic, which does not, and this is the important part, it does not share the same molecular profile as the, as the classic psychedelics. Rather than being an agonist of the 2A receptor, it's an antagonist of the NMDA receptor. It's a very different profile. I'm still a little confused yes. about this question mm -hmm. um, because you have this prior distribution that strongly mm -hmm. peaks. But so is it possible if you measured not differences but percentage differences from that peak baseline that you would have a more that that this conclusion that you just said would mm -hmm. be different? So I'm just worried that you know I look at this and I say, ah, oh, yeah, there's a big increase in the high in the high wave number, but there's already a, a high wave number bias in the in mm -hmm. in the background of phosphian, right? In the background modes. And so I'm worried that it matters how you define the signal, or is that not a worry? I I think that was his question. Yeah, so yeah that was yeah. also my question. And so, yeah, it's, right? It's, it's, it's the same thing. I think, I'm not sure. Would you see this differential pattern, though, across I ways? Think over if one goes down, up, it, would, I, it would be very, very small. I mean, don't see the difference in the Certainly, that's true. But if it's significant, then it's almost the same. Yes. But if it's a percentage of the, if you have, if what you need to measure is a percentage of what you had before, then I'm worried that, yeah, okay. I've not come across, I'm, I'm not sure how changing, changing the unit from value to changing percentage should change the stats. My intuition is that it shouldn't. Well, I'm just worried. Um, it's not about the stats per se, it's about this background distribution and how you take that into account. Mm -hmm. Talk about offline, I guess, but just yeah, yeah. I guess I think in, the, in the region where it matters, namely where the switch of the yeah. uh, lost in mind, then the contribution is quite wide, you know, so, yeah. so it's probably yeah. fine. But I, in the edges, it might be in so, if fine. it helps. I, I again, I'm not quite sure that I'm getting the question, but I'm happy to talk more, more later. But if it helps, uh, for example, we have shown that when if you just do a test retest analysis, so exactly the same setup but there's no drug in either condition. You just people scan twice, then you don't see this pattern. So it just looks random and mostly almost always non-significant. Yeah. So the significant, the fact that it is consistent, that is not something that is, you're guaranteed to get just by scanning people twice. Totally. So there's clearly a significant change. The question is, is it wave number dependent? Mm -hmm. And that I think depends on how you do the, the subtraction of this baseline because you have mm -hmm. this in homogeneity in the wave number to begin right. with. So that's really the question. Not that the effect is okay, right. The effect is probably significant. How you interpret the wave number dependence, that's mm -hmm. what I'm confused about. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, the effect might actually be percentage wise, and I think it'll be stronger in the tail. Could be. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah, maybe it's exactly. so small. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's a question I've never gotten from the neuroscientist, so thank you. <laughs> no, so usually um all of these are, are different. That's one of the that's one of the things that makes that difficult to compare even even the scales. 
like the different drugs, those drugs have different potency. So in general, these have been found from the literature to be strong enough to induce the uh, subjective effect that uh, people are interested in. So none of these studies were done with the intention of then applying harmonics. These are all retrospective analysis of data that we had before. They do this in a safe region of the drug, like the minimal dose. Yes, the yes, yes. So it, it's not it's not the smallest amount that you can get. It's, it's not microdosing. It has to be strong enough that you can see substantial subjective experiences. But of course, it's it has to be safe. Um, so for in, in the case of ketamine, this is the psychedelic dose. So it's not anesthetic people were still responsive but all of them of course different drugs different doses yes uh, that again depends on the drug so for example the, the lsd is a slow drug so this scan they had multiple scans that's why you can actually see here multiple uh, comparisons uh, being done so they had also a condition where you had LSD with music rather than without. Uh, LSD is a very long one. So I think this was about at around the peak. So I think four hours in. Um, whereas DMT, this one here, DMT is extremely fast. The entire trip will effectively be over within 10 minutes. So this was done. They were already in the scanner. That's why we had the pre-scan, pre-injection and post-injection, because people were in the scanner for about two minutes, they were scanned, then you give the drug, and then the scan here covers the entire eight minutes of the trip. So very different time scales for that. Another question. Sure. Do you know if people with this people with uh, psychosis? So people who are hallucinating without drugs? Is the uh, same kind of frequencies that you see there? We don't know. This is, and you'll see some of these are, you know, from the last few years or even from this year. So many of the questions of that kind, the answer is going to be no, but we would really like to know. Okay. Um, so for example, we now also have, I have a student who has been doing this, but using anesthetic doses of ketamine. And... <laughs> Very good question. I gave the student the data. Just data, I think. Another question on the sure. I like the question from Mike, and he has similar question. Like the epilepsy, there's a hyper synchronization. So yeah. do you know if <laughs> that has started those modes in epilepsy? Same question, same answer. Unfortunately, we would love to know, but so far we don't. Yeah. But, but the, the interesting thing is that you know uh, you haven't said it explicitly, but somehow. You, you suggest that large-scale patterns are somehow more, uh, have more function than small-scale patterns. No. High frequency as... Depends what you mean by function. Yeah. I, I don't think... So what we do see is that the high-frequency patterns seem to be more susceptible to this particular kind of perturbation. So pharmacological perturbation with a psychedelic. Right. That is what we are seeing, at least for the ketamine side. But I don't know whether they um, they have a strong relationship to different kinds of cognitive function that we don't know. Because because in epilepsy, you find actually huge synchronization mm -hmm. in the brain. So you would actually, I think you would see the reverse pattern of this. Aha. We do have, thank you for that question. I promise it was not planted. Um, an answer on the on the on the on the, on the screen. Oh. First, yeah, we'll just, this. Yes, just yeah. And we may okay then. Then you have to go Right. So yes, you do sometimes see the opposite pattern as we are seeing here in a case where, like in epilepsy, you are losing consciousness. Although mechanisms are very different. Here we are looking at anesthesia with propofol. So propofol is arguably the most commonly used anesthetic or one of the most commonly used anesthetics. If you've had surgery, there's a good chance propofol was used in that. And so here we render people unconscious with propofol as assessed by loss of behavioral responsiveness. And you see exactly the opposite pattern. So the low frequencies increase in their prevalence. So increased structural coupling. The high frequencies decrease in their prevalence. So decreased structural decoupling. 
And this we confirm at different doses of propofol. So we see, for example, this pattern is reversed when people recover from the anesthesia. All of a sudden, they go back to being more uh, normal-like. And this pattern becomes more pronounced as the anesthesia becomes deeper. So we have these two opposite situations where you get more structural coupling under anesthesia and less structural coupling under psychedelics. And both of those have been observed in a different context, so using a different kind of analysis. So they are consistent with what we know from the literature before. If you just look at how function and structure, as in functional connectivity, under psychedelics become less similar to structural connectivity, and under anesthesia becomes more similar to structural connectivity. But that, of course, does not look at the different scales. Now, though, there is, as I was mentioning earlier, more than one way of losing consciousness. One of them is anesthesia that is controlled and reversible, but we also have disorders of consciousness where people are, uh, they've suffered a traumatic or anoxic brain injury and they are chronically unconscious. However, sometimes this diagnosis of being chronically unconscious might not be entirely accurate because if, even though those people, if you ask them, can you squeeze my hand? They will not do that. If you then, as Adrian Owen famously did about 20 years ago, if you put them in a scanner, in the fMRI scanner, and you ask them, if you want to say yes to my question, please imagine playing tennis. And if you want to say no to my question, please imagine moving around your home. Your home? Your home. Okay. We know that in healthy individuals, those kinds of uh, mental actions, as, as, as we call them, they will activate very reliably very different brain regions. There's a brain region that determines navigation, and there's a brain region that determines motor actions, even when they're just imagined. And it turns out that a good proportion, estimated to be even up to 40% of people, 25 sometimes, can actually do this. And when I say people, I mean, in this case, patients with a disorder of consciousness. So even though the patient cannot perform, cannot squeeze your hand, does not look like they're responding to painful stimuli, you ask them, can you imagine playing tennis? And you see the right area activating. And then can you stop? And that area stops. And then can you imagine navigating around your home? Different area activates. Stop now, area deactivates. So it's, effect yes? Oh. oh, I think the internet went and came back again. Sorry, this might be happening a little bit. We don't know exactly why. All right. Sorry about that. But just to be clear, you're talking about patients in coma. Uh, so they are post comatose. So coma is when you have eyes closed. Um, after a coma, which typically lasts an, until two weeks. Uh, and we're not talking pharmacological coma, we're talking uh, induced. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we're talking a spontaneous coma. After coma, you recover, but it's not like in the movies. Like in the movies, person recovers from the coma and they're just fine. That's not what happens. So there are many stages of disorder of consciousness. Um, so typically there's two broad categories, but now it's, it's becoming increasingly more, more fine-grained. Um, so you can have a vegetative state that is now, uh, the, the nomenclature is now transitioning away from that, which is not very, uh, arguably very respectful of patients, and towards unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So the idea is you can see physiologically sleep-wake cycles. Eyes will open at some point, and then they will close, and you will see some EEG signatures. But even when their eyes are open, those patients are not communicative. They don't respond behaviorally. They don't track with eyes, etc. And then there is minimally conscious state, which is when occasionally you might see some signs of consciousness. So they might be temporarily conscious for a little bit or conscious a little bit in some sense, uh, but it's not uh, a sustained improvement um, throughout. And here we had patients in, in, in both categories, but as you'll see in a moment, we uh, don't stratify them by this overt behavior. We stratify them by what we call a covert 
consciousness, so based on the fMRI test. Uh, so this this was scanned in, in Cambridge, which is uh, which is where Adrian Owen is, uh, did his his experiments. There's now just just come out a very big uh, paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that is combining data from a lot of different centers, like hundreds of of patients. And they're finding that this uh, it's sometimes called cognitive motor dissociation. I think that's the term that they're using. Um, I was not involved with it, but some of my uh, colleagues from this paper uh, were some of the leaders of that. And they, uh, I think their estimate is about 25% could be uh, in this case. I should add one caveat on this, which is that that is likely to be an underestimate because this test is actually quite demanding for a patient. So, for example, you need to understand language to know this. You might very well, if you've suffered from a you know, car accident that took out parts of your brain, your language regions might very well be impaired or disconnected. You need sustained attention for several minutes because to get enough statistical power to tell, is this region active? You don't just do it once. You have to do it multiple times. You need enough working memory to remember that you've been asked to do this. You need memory of what your home look, looks like. What is tennis? So there's a lot of ways that this can go into a false negative. But when you have a positive signal, we think it's a really good indicator that there's probably something there. Um, so it's a, in this sense, it's a, it's a sobering message. But what we can see is then this is for the science of consciousness. This presents a very unique opportunity to look at beyond just loss of responsiveness and just seeing can we track something more about what makes the brain conscious. Yes. Does it mean that conscious healthy people can fail this test? I don't know of that happening, but I, I imagine in principle they could. So, for example, a patient with very, you know, with a uh, language impairment who doesn't, of, of course, like very simple, very simple uh, example, but uh, if the person, if the patient doesn't know that, if you don't know what, what is the native langu language of the patient, because it's just a patient who you recover from a car crash. And you bring you bring them to to the hospital. If it happens to be a foreign a foreigner, a tourist, or something, then you would think, oh well, this patient doesn't understand. Yeah. I don't think that happened. Yeah, my question was more about like let's say that we have someone who has like dyslexia or some kind of other different skill set of imagination, then they could utterly fail this. I in guess principle, in principle. I, have I I have not seen that uh, reported. But I'm guessing it. I'm guessing it's possible. For example, attention disorder. You might just not be fixating on on the imagery long enough. Or I guess maybe if you have aphantasia, um, which is a disorder, well, not a disorder. Right? It's not a disorder. But uh, some people their mental imagery is very vivid, and for others it's not. And so I'm guessing if you have like a very extreme end of aphantasia, maybe the right regions just don't activate. But I don't have evidence of of that. It, that is actually the cool thing that one could do. Um, but for many of these patients, we did see at least one of the regions uh, activating in the right order. And so this is what we're seeing next. Now, this is, um, I, I should add this, after you correct for multiple comparisons across the different bins, this, these individual bins are not significant. Um, and this is only eight patients versus 14. Eight patients who could do the test versus 14 who could not. So this inference should be taken more, more carefully. And we're now looking at whether we can access the hundreds of patients from this New England uh, paper to see if we can replicate this. But nonetheless, I think you can see that there is a consistency towards the high frequencies again. So again, that, that seems to be where some of the more interesting uh, consciousness relevant, at the very least, um, events are, um, are happening. And the one thing that we can do to try and validate this uh, relationship that we're seeing, whether it's meaningful or not, is we can take this signature from the patients. So again, this is, uh, I should emphasize, right? The anesthesia signature is obtained comparing people who are healthy and have no anesthetic in their bloodstream. So before anesthesia versus during anesthesia. The DOC patient signature is not against healthy controls. That is against a different group of patients who are also chronically unresponsive. A clinician would say they are in a vegetative state or in a minimally conscious state. So this is a within group comparison. 
The only difference between these two subgroups, small subgroups of patients, is that one subgroup can perform this mental imagery task and the other cannot. So it's a much more stringent test. And what we do is we can extract that DOC patient signature, so the pattern that most distinguishes between these two groups. And so uh, which one have the depressed by feelings? Uh, those who cannot. Can. Those who cannot. So those that we can we think are probably unconscious. We don't have, again, risk of false negatives, which might also contribute to our staff not being significant. But if we assume that the test is perfect so that all of these patients who cannot do the test are actually unconscious, as their behavior suggests, mm -hmm. then those who cannot do the test are those who have this signature that looks more like anesthesia. And what we see is that when you take that signature that distinguishes two groups of patients and you ask, how well does the signature look like the pattern that we see in people as they're undergoing anesthesia? So in other words, does anesthesia make your brain more like the brain of a DOC patient? The answer is yes. The more anesthetic you get, the more your signature looks like the DOC signature. And then as you're, and this is the, the shown at the top. And then at the bottom, as you remove anesthetic or bladder, as you allow the anesthetic to be spontaneously removed from the body, leading into recovery of consciousness, then the signature starts looking less and less like the signature of a patient with a disorder of consciousness. Notice that in both cases here, the second condition is the one on the right. So that's why the two, the two correlations go the same direction. And on the contrary, you can do the same trick with the signature that we got from ketamine and ask, it does, is this just a signature of ketamine or does this generalize to the other psychedelics? Because just we can eyeball it and we can see, yes, it looks like the other psychedelics. But if we take that signature and ask, Within LSD, how does that change? We see that the more your brain looks like the ketamine signature, the more you will rate the LSD experience as being intense. And all of this does not work if you use randomized harmonics. And there's different ways that we randomize the harmonics. You randomize them, you don't see that. And all of this does not just track silly things like the amount of motion that a patient has. Of course, anesthesia would reduce motion and psychedelics would make people twitch a bit more, but that is not what's driving our effects. We will come back to one. Yes. Come back to the matter because you make a, like a composition that is based on the group level connect on mm -hmm. how much do you, do you miss by not doing individualized the so uh, that one we do get quite a bit from from neuroscientists, especially because the patients uh, they might have part very altered connectomes. In fact, we know that they have altered connectomes, and so the the choice that we had there was: do you use individualized connectomes? And in some cases, we just didn't have that, so that choice was made for us because it's not very common to acquire this this data. Um, but the question is, if you use an individualized connectome, then the same harmonics are not the same anymore. So you're using, it's basically, in neuroscience, it's common to normalize brain to, to a standard template. It's so-called MNI space. So that, of course, you know, people of different height and body size will have different size of brains. Every brain is different, but we all bring them together into the same space so that when we want to refer to, you know, prefrontal cortex, we have a common set of coordinates that we can point to. And of course, that means that, you know, some brains have been working more than others, et cetera. This is, and, and that analysis we also do for these patients. So they might have a, a piece missing, but we still bring them into that same space. And that's the same thing that we're doing here. So we're bringing everybody into the same overall harmonic space of the human connectome at the risk of losing some personal specific information. But with the advantage, we can talk about harmonic 47 if we wanted to, and that would be the same harmonic for everybody. So you always have this question of, is this the same space or do I go individualized? And how much can I generalize from the individual to the population if I'm, if I'm using individualized data? Here, because we wanted to compare across different data sets, different states of consciousness, we thought having a common space was the, was the way to go there. <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah, that sounds like a, a really good idea. I'm wondering about the individual response to a particular dose. Mm -hmm. So everyone has a, a very individual response to drug doses. Is there any way to try to normalize that variability? You know, uh, that that seems to me it would be really big and, and hard to get hard to get around. Yeah. So for the for the anesthetics, it's a bit easier because there, instead of use, sometimes you use a fixed dose, um, but you can also instead. Uh, increase the dose until you observe a particular behavioral response. So that's what we use. That's what we often do, and that's why we could do this correlation with the different dose that Can we you had. Do that with ketamine and LSD. It's harder because it's much harder to get a sense for this is, you know, what's a ten on that intensity scale. Yeah, exactly. It's not quite the same, and usually, you know, there's latencies there. So you admit for for DMT, it's very fast acting, so people are now trying. To get a more titrated, so that so that you you can control what's going on. But for LSD, you give a you know a dose, and then four hours later, it's too late to intervene on that if it was too high or too low. And so yes, the whole point there is to say we can get these consistent signatures across different ways of losing consciousness. And the idea is we can home in, but try to home in at least on what makes consciousness in the brain versus what is specific to other kinds of, of changes there. And this is just a little recap of what we've seen so far, slightly different way of, of showing the same, uh, the same effects, which is to say loss of consciousness, less, uh, loss of consciousness, more structure function coupling, psychedelics, less structure function coupling, more decoupling is what you observe. But the point here is you can also do this same analysis in different species because, of course, you will have to use a species-specific connectome. But as I was mentioning earlier, many, at least the anesthetics, we know they have very conserved effects. And so, for example, we can use, again, this is also, as I was mentioning earlier, you can get eigenmodes out of a lot of different, effectively anything you can get an adjacency matrix of, you can get uh, an eigenmode if you're so inclined. The ones we use are at the top. On the right, you can see the ones that we can get from a macaque connectome, which is obtained from track tracing, which is invasive. We cannot do that in humans, but it is a lot more accurate because we can actually image the individual uh, fibers biologically going. Uh, people have used a sphere as a way of getting eigenmodes. And because the brain is <laughs> spherical, then you actually get very similar eigenmodes, especially at the lower, at the lower scale. People have also used this more refined version of considering geometry, so proximity across over the spherical mesh. This is just to say this is not the only way to get eigenmodes, but one of those ways of getting eigenmodes is uh, using a macaque connectome and then performing the same kind of analysis. So you get eigenmodes. Of course, for the macaque, these are uh, much larger. So instead of getting 18,000, we get 82. So that's a big difference. Uh, so really, all we're getting is the low frequency eigenmodes, because of course you can't get eighteen thousand injections into uh, any brain really. So big caveat there. But so here we're only focusing on the low frequencies. But what we see is that when you anesthetize macaques with different anesthetics, especially once you get to the high doses, regardless of whether that's high dose of ketamine, so anesthetic dose of ketamine or propofol or sevoflurane, you get this increase in the low frequency harmonics. As a reminder, these are the only harmonics that we can see with this particular analysis. And when you administer during anesthesia, deep brain stimulation of the thalamus, which behaviorally restores consciousness in the macaque, then you see that that goes back down. So this is not just about having the drug in your system. This is about whether that drugs makes you conscious, makes you unconscious or not, because you can stimulate different parts of the thalamus, which is a region sort of deep inside the brain. If you stimulate the wrong region of the thalamus, the monkey does not awaken and nothing happens. But if you stimulate the right region of the thalamus, the monkey does wake up, opens its eyes, it's now oriented again, and we see that that pattern is going way back to what it was during wakefulness. So it's not just about the drug effects on respiration, et cetera. It's more profound than that. 
So I want to draw a means in the mock class. Uh, so each each of these in at the top, it's a different anesthetic, different levels of anesthetic. So light sevoflurane, light propofol, and you tend to see the effect with the big uh, doses that definitely knock the monkey out. And here it's a, a awake off, meaning there's no stimulation, so just anesthesia, big propofol, deep propofol anesthesia. And then this is a low stimulation of the central thalamus, so the region we care about, high stimulation of the central thalamus. And then high and low stimulation of a control region, which is the ventral thalamus, which does not induce behavioral uh, reawakening. And just to say, and I think I will conclude afterwards for the sake of timing, um, this is just to say, I don't want you to come away from this talk thinking that there is just a uni dimensional continuum between anesthesia, loss of consciousness, and psychedelics. That is what you might think based on this way of doing the analysis. If you look at structure function coupling, yes, there is a one dimensional continuum and they are on opposite ends. But if you do another way of analyzing the data, so someone was asking earlier about functional harmonics. Sometimes the same principle is called in the literature looking at functional gradients. It's the same mathematics, just one of those occasions where people rediscovered the same idea but just didn't realize that it was already discovered. So they give it a different name, used, did a different analysis and found the same things. So here you can use functional harmonics. So effectively what, what is known as the gradients and you can look at the range of the principal gradient. I'm not gonna go into detail about that. The, the, the only point that you really need to know here from, from this slide and the next is these have been replicated within different anesthetics, within different ways of losing consciousness. You can see that at the bottom, the point here is if instead of looking at structure function coupling, you look at this purely functional analysis, then all of a sudden psychedelics are also very consistent with each other, but they are also very similar to perturbations of consciousness that reduce consciousness, so anesthesia and disorders of consciousness. So this is to say, depending on the lens that you use to look at your functional data, this is the same functional data. In these cases, it's literally the same people. Depending on how you look at your functional data, you might think that anesthesia and psychedelics are opposite ends of a continuum, or you might think that anesthesia and psychedelics are same deviations from a sort of peak uh, healthy, healthy state. What is common is that anesthesia very, very consistently looks like a disorders of consciousness. But different lenses on the data will tell you different things. So you need to consider multiple scales, but also multiple dimensions of, of the data. Right. And all of this is just to say we see the same thing in, across different species. Well, for the answer. But what you're saying is mm -hmm. like if I do a different mapping into a different phase, yes. then I actually find that. Uh, anesthesia and, and uh, LSD actually have similar effects, right? Yes. So if you map function onto structure, anesthesia and psychedelics will look different. Yeah. If you instead basically just remap function onto itself, a bit like doing a PCA in a sense, like if you look at the dimensions of your functional data that best explain those same functional data rather than allowing structure to dictate those dimensions, yeah. then you will find that the, data, the dimensions of the functional data as dictated by function itself look similar across these different perturbations of consciousness. And we don't have a unified way of explaining all of those at once, but it's important to realize that those different ways exist. But do, do these, uh, I don't understand exactly the function and chemistry approach, but does that take into account the spatial extent uh, of, of the or is it... Implicitly so, in the sense that regions that are further away tend to have weaker connectivity, which are functional connectivity. So this is looking at, I'm just basic, it's basically fancy PCA, if, uh, if I'm allowed to use this, this term. So you're not looking at structure. If instead you allow structure to dictate the terms of the space that you're mapping, then the picture is different. So different spaces will change. Yeah. And I think. I'll probably conclude here on this slide here to say similar or different depends on how you're looking at the same thing. 
it's not just a one dimension that you can immediately look and see what's happening. And I'll finish here for this. <laughs> really interesting idea and so I'm, I'm naive in terms of consciousness studies but do you what, what do you expect for temporal variability for a normal person apart from sleeping mm -hmm. do we do we have micro episodes of losing consciousness or is this something that we you expect that mm -hmm. so if you were to look at windowed versions of this for a, a normal subject over time well i'm very glad you're asking this the another i don't know if no it's not here but the other dimension in this same paper that we talk about is time uh, -huh. uh so here we, we have just spatial dimension and we have information and time is is the other one uh and that's what i did the first half of my phd was about so uh yes there are changes just fluctuations in arousal for example so people might get more or less drowsy it's quite common for people to get more drowsy towards the end of the scan for example caffeine will have an effect on that um, and also when you're falling asleep, there is, or even when you're just drowsy, there is this idea that you fall asleep all at once. That's not actually how it happens. So you can have episodes of local sleep. And basically one, one way that people think sleep is happening is when those episodes, those islands of local sleep, they basically coalesce finally into global sleep. And that's when you're unconscious. But when you're very drowsy, that's why you have, for example, these lapses of attention when you're drowsy, especially that's why you shouldn't drive a car because if the wrong if an island of sleep is temporarily taking place over your attentional regions you might just not see that pedestrian can, um, lapse, can lapses of attention be described as lapses of consciousness or is that that's not that's not for that would be a good question for philosopher me <laughs> which is a different possible world that i did not take okay. um but yes so there is a lot of, of temporal variability uh there and some people think these disorders of consciousness are basically chronic prevalence of this local sleep, an island of sleep that just never never wakes up around the lesion. Uh, I just wondered, so with the high frequency and the hallucinogens, is that to do with the visual cortex? And the fact that it, no, it's not. No. So um, we we see that throughout because we we can't localize this yeah. because what we are losing is the spatial resolution. And what we're getting is the resolution of spatial scale, but those are whole brain patterns, uh, whole cortex patterns. So we, we are losing the subcortex by doing this uh, this projection. That's one of the limitations. Um, but yes, so we cannot localize it to that, but it does it temporarily it's not localized to that particular region. But it could be comfortable during this. So that's it could be. Uh, and then I, because the other way to get unconscious with a drug is with alcohol. So mm -hmm. does that have to be the same way or? I never actually looked at uh, alcohol unconsciousness data. It's very hard to get people to consent to being scanned while being unconscious. <laughs> uh, so I don't think anybody has tried. Sorry, this reminds me of one thing, which is there's a very important slide that I don't want to miss. Sorry. Uh, just because we were talking about data collection, I did not collect any of these data myself. All of these data were shared with me by industrious and generous people. And likewise, I did not come up with the mathematics myself. So there's a lot of people who deserve credit for the work that you've, that you've seen. I'm just here, you know, tip of the iceberg as a representative of them. On that note, I also want to make sure that I thank the people who allow me to be here, uh, and that includes the Institute for Emerging Phenomena. So thank you very much for that invitation and the people who have, who have funded my work in the past and continue to fund us. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to make sure that people, the credit is given because a lot of credit is, is due. Sure. So did anybody do this with people that actually are in the meditative state? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's not published as far as I know, um, but Selena Tassoy has is very interested in, in meditation. Uh, so she's looked at this in sleep, and sleep looks like the anesthesia. And I think deep meditation was also looking a bit, uh, a bit like that, but not, uh, you know, I, I only saw the 
work in progress um, report. Yeah. If we have more questions, people to the discussion. Is there much? Well, no, that's thanks. I'm very good. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time.